Hey, Dustin Vano here. This video, I'm gonna share something that uh, was actually pretty important in my journey of how I grew to really like Databricks and prefer Databricks over other uh, data warehouse platforms and cloud platforms that I was using. So um, I do work at Databricks, but this is my own opinions, my own thoughts. Let me tell you a quick bit of my story of why I think this is so important. So I went into consulting and had been had done a lot of Spark in the past, but was really getting much deeper into Databricks than I had before that. And we needed to set up full like developer environments for about five different team members, I believe was kind of our starting count and be able to deploy these things, uh, not just to a development environment or to some kind of uh, open production environment where I can do whatever I want as the data engineer, but actually one that follows some very strict guidelines and, and audits for the deployment process. And so that's where I really got to take some of the practices I learned from software development, usually from software developers I worked with telling me, what are you, what is your team even doing? Uh, the way you deploy is terrible. You need to fix this, right? And so I learned all these things. Um, we were able to apply them with Databricks pretty well, but it took quite a bit of manual scripting. Um, there were some things that were around. They were very different than what exists today, but like Databricks Connect was around kind of the original version of that. So we were able to work either from our local machine or from the workspace. And we got to a pretty good groove there. And I really appreciated how I could work locally or work with my IDE uh, connected to Databricks directly or work on the Databricks workspace with like notebooks and some of the great features that they have there. There was a lot of things that have improved so much since then. And so what happened on my journey is I went and worked on some other projects using uh, things like Snowflake and, and other data platform tools and was trying to implement the same sort of like rigorous procedures of, okay, we're gonna use version control, we're going to merge code, we're going to do pull reviews for everything we do. And um, those sorts of things were quite a bit more challenging with the way code was saved and the way you could uh, compare code versions. Um, maybe the forcing to use SQL for nearly everything at times was part of the challenges I faced and just, I guess, less of a robust developer environment with options about how different team members who have different preferences could work together and still collaborate well. And so uh, as I kind of got to work with Databricks and with these other platforms, I really uh, decided that I wanted to work exclusively with Databricks essentially uh, for a time. And that's how I ended up uh, going a little further and, and going through the interview process and deciding to work for Databricks instead of staying a consultant and working on multiple different platforms. Doesn't mean those other tools haven't improved at all. It doesn't mean I'll never go back to having to bounce between all these different platforms. But that's kind of my story about why this was so important. As I got into Databricks, I got sort of some questions about, hey, does anyone know how to do this? And I was like, yeah, I've done that before. So I looked into kind of the newest features from Databricks and found out that there's actually way better ways to do it than what I had to do in the past. And so, and those have even continued to evolve since I first arrived at Databricks as an employee. So what I'm gonna share with you is kind of my tips on if you feel like you don't have the best development, best practices right now, what should you implement first and what does that look like when integrated to Databricks, okay? Uh, I'll share a bit about the development life cycle just to try to clarify what we're talking about, why any of this matters. Um, and if this type of content is useful for you, please do subscribe to my channel, click the notifications, because I do hope to come back and cover maybe some more specific questions people ask and more deep dives on some of these topics. Okay, let's do a quick overview of the developer lifecycle. I'm gonna use some slides that Kimberly Mahoney, who's a, a colleague that knows a lot about this topic and presented with me at past Data Community Summit. She created these and shared these there. Uh, I'll continue to link to other resources in the notes of this uh, video so that you can find these types of materials and future videos that maybe she'll release or others will do on this topic. So here's the idea. If I'm a developer and I get this request that we need a report on the flight delays. Say we're working for an airline, we're pulling in information about all the different flights. Um, we would wanna know what types of delays are happening as well as obviously other information. So when we first get this request, we need a modernized, maybe more real-time version of flight delays. Um, there'd be this work, this life cycle of planning and then development, confirming that it works and then releasing it. Uh, but in reality, sometimes we hit this check of does it work, we find it does not, and we go back to the development, right? So it's a little bit more iterative than that first image shows. Once we do finally get this working and get it released, 
we might get feedback like, hey, we're seeing some issues where this uh, pipeline can't handle the peak load or certain things that we decided the first time around aren't quite meeting today's needs. So can we make some changes to it? So we kind of go back to the planning stage for that and we start to go through this cycle again. So notice we haven't talked about any of the tools involved here, but this is the general concept of what we're trying to do. We're trying to do this in obviously a high quality way, something that those that are asking us to improve our data platform and our data pipelines will be happy with the results they get. So now let's start getting into the top things that I recommend implementing to be on this path to good best practices when following the developer lifecycle. So the number one thing is version control. Essentially, we're talking about making sure we've got the right version of code that has gone to production and we keep track of that historically over time. It also gives us the ability to go work on new things, make mistakes and roll back very easily even before we hit production. Number two is running automated code tests. So as I'm writing out code, whether that's PySpark and notebooks, um, perhaps even SQL code, though that gets a little bit more advanced into how to do it, or a little, it's a little less mature essentially into what practices people use. Testing our code as we build and immediately after making changes is very helpful to the development process. Uh, this could be manual test as well, but really having some scripted automated tests is going to help you along the way. And then number three, and arguably two and three could be swapped, um, but number three is deploying this code and the jobs involved to separate isolated environments in order to make sure that once you get to production, you have high quality working system. How do we make sure that we can easily deploy code changes once they've passed our normal reviews and run the tests along the way to make sure what we deploy is working? Um, and then running automated system health, that would be number four in my opinion. Uh, after that at number five would be running data quality checks and tests. So how do we make sure that not just the code has worked properly in production, but that the data that we have on the other side is matching expectations. And then number six would be automating the data schema deployments. When I need to modify what my table has in it, how do I make those changes, okay? And then uh, capping off my list for now, this all might change as things continue to evolve and as I think about it more, but number seven is automated rollback on failures. And so I, I would say that usually there's, in my experience, there's a bit of manual intervention to decide that the failure is significant enough for a rollback rather than a quick hot fix. Um, but being able to, once you see something's not working, swap back to the prior version quickly and effectively without hurting the end users of this project product, whether it's your internal analyst or perhaps customers of this data platform you've built. Okay, so that's my list of seven for now. Stay tuned for me to try and cover in future videos. Thanks for joining. Please subscribe to this channel to be up to date on the latest. See you next time.